webinar series. Thank you for recording, Mitchell, appreciate that. Uh, this is our seventh year, can hardly believe it, but 21-22, we have a great webinar series planned for this year uh, running up through May of 2022, which is kind of a hard year to say there, but um, welcome in everyone, happy to have you. So as you heard, our webinar is being recorded today. The title of our webinar today is Welcome Back, Making Science Education Meaningful Through Designing Authentic Earth and Space Science Learning to Reach All Students. And uh, the organizers of this webinar series, as you may know, myself, Aida Awad, I'm past president of NAGT, Ed Robeck from the American Geosciences Institute, and Missy Holder, who represents the National Earth Science Teachers Association. Uh, on the back end of things, thank you to Mitchell and Bradley for uh, working the back end of our webinar and getting us all prepared uh, registration, et cetera, for the webinar. We very much appreciate your support. So today we have two groups of presenters. First of all, we'll be hearing from TJ McKenna from Phenomena for NGSS. And then following TJ's uh, presentation, we'll be hearing from Vanessa Wilbrink and Jennifer Childress Self from West Ed. There is of course going to be a little bit of time for discussion and question and answer. We really encourage you to drop those ideas and thoughts and comments and yes questions into the chat box as we go through the webinar. And really don't feel like it's just a question and answer box. It really is a chat box and we'd like to see um, just a really rich conversation going on there in the chat box. So if something just strikes you as something you've seen in a classroom or might like to see in a classroom or it gives you another idea, please drop that into the chat box as we go through. And then we do have a post webinar survey. Um, we'll be dropping that link in at the end of the webinar. So it is there, you'll see that come back around as well. A couple of announcements upcoming on October 14th, which will be the second webinar in this series. We'll have a webinar presented by uh, three specialists from ESRI, and they'll be talking about ESRI for K-12 and the NGSS ESS. So we're really excited about that one upcoming. Watch for registration information to come to your inbox in the next week or so. And then also um, we have a needs assessment survey going. Many of you have already seen that and have responded to it. Thank you very much if you're one of those that have. We very much appreciate the responses and uh, we'll drop the link in to that needs assessment survey here. And then again, at the end of the webinar, if you could, of course, after the webinar today, take just about four or five minutes and complete that survey for us. It will be very helpful. We really do value your input um, as we're building out these series. And then of course, our entire archive of webinars, all six past seasons are available on the AGI YouTube channel as a playlist. So you can go to YouTube, search for American Geosciences Institute, and then click on playlists and you'll find the entire playlist there if you'd like to catch up on some of our past webinars. So as a reminder, please feel free to drop your thoughts, ideas, questions, comments into the chat as we're going through. Um, our first presenter today is TJ McKenna. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and turn things over to TJ. TJ, take it away. All right. All right, can we all see my screen? Yes, we're great. Perfect. So um, like you said, uh, thank you for having me. My name is TJ McKenna. Um, I am at Boston University. Um, and uh, really kind of long story short, my, it boils down to I love authentic science experiences. I love having them. I love seeing students have them. And I love seeing just humans in general have them. Um, you know, we get really excited when we figure something out or when we make a connection that we didn't have before. Um, and so um, if I go back to, I think it was 2015, um, when this site started, the kind of birth of the site, I was in the back of the room, I was supporting some um, facilitators who were learning to lead NGSS uh, professional development. And I, session after session, kept seeing teachers in the room open a new window and they would type in NGSS space phenomena, and then they would hit search. And they would scroll and scroll and scroll and they wouldn't find anything. Um, and so I kept seeing, and so this site really was born over a lunch break during a professional development session um, where I'm like, well, if nobody else is doing it, uh, we might as well start a place where um, it at least pops up. And, um, and I always say that this site 
um, probably doesn't have the perfect phenomenon that you're looking for for your students that's you know the perfect for that day um, but it at least gets you thinking it'll get some ideas um, flowing and um, and so with the theme today of welcome back um, I thought I would bring it back I'd bring it back to the beginning um, and the first one added um, is this tree hopper ant so I figured thinking about like how could we go all the way back to the first one added there um, and, and which would then bring us current um, and so I'm not sure if everybody saw this, um, but this was yesterday on NPR, the story about um, a quake in Mexico titled First Came a Quake in Mexico, Then Strange Blue Lights, People Feared the Apocalypse. Very clickbaity, very exciting. I know I clicked on it, saw the tweet, wanted to see it. Um, and so um, always makes me think like, could this possibly be connected to everything else happening on a global earth system? Um, and so a colleague um, and I, um, Chris Siminski, uh, we, we love playing games. You know, we love having fun with science. And so um, one of the games uh, that I'm not sure if everybody remembers, but Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, thumbs up if you remember, I see some nodding. Um, and the kind of overall gist is that everything can kind of lead back to Kevin Bacon. Um, and so thinking about that, like, does that work for phenomena on this planet? Um, and uh, and so, if we're thinking back to this tree hopper ant, it's called a tree hopper ant because it looks like an ant, but it's really a tree hopper. And what's up with that? And I'm always excited about bugs. Um, if you can see in my background, I've got a. Uh, this is what a master's degree in entomology gets you. A lot of dead bugs on the wall, um, and a lot of people like to show me on their phone. What's this dead bug? Um, I love playing. What's that bug? And so thinking about the first, like this is a weird looking insect, um, but if we were to dig a little deeper into it, uh, we start to learn that it creates these like crazy vibrations. Like that's one of the things that this ant does. Not only does it have this weird strategy, but it looks different. And so um, if we were to think from a kind of an earth science lens, this thing creates these different vibrations. Um, and so, and I wanna kind of model the, the walk through this De Kevin Bacon kind of six degrees of phenomena um, and model it as if like, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, and I really like to think that science thinking is really just kind of everyday thinking um, about topics that have to do with science. Um, and I always tell my students, bring up any topic, anything that happens on this planet um, and, and we can together dig out the science. <laughs> we can find the science in it. There's always uh, science somewhere. And so, thinking about vibrations. Um, so they're, they're trying to make cool music. They're like little aphid DJs. They're trying to make some vibrations. They're trying to get the, um, the mates to come and say like, wow, I like what I'm picking up, what this little aphid's putting down and I wanna go see where, where he is. Um, and so thinking about vibrations, I think most people think about music. Um, you know, everybody thinks about the DJ, the music that's happening or the band, you know, those are the, those, those draw us, they bring us together, um, they bring us towards the music. Um, but again, still, we're thinking about these vibrations in terms of a bug. And how is that going to bring us back to that earthquake and those crazy blue lights in Mexico? Um, and so we're thinking about all these different things about vibrations. Um, the vibrations on the bottom right, we see um, this... Uh, I always mix them up. I don't know if it's a crocodile or alligator, um, but it's a very old, old lizard um, making some sounds to attract a mate. And you see the vibrations actually cause something to happen in the water. So we see the water kind of bubbling up and, and almost leaping out of, um, out of that pond or that river. Uh, and then, you know, thinking about guitars, we think about the, um, you know, I, I'm a big bird nerd too. Um, and so when I always think about dual voice boxes, imagine having two voice boxes, you can sing two songs at the same time. Um, and, and then thinking about just the vibrations that you see. Um, and so to zoom out a little bit, if specific vibrations make music, like what about huge vibrations? Um, and if anybody's a, a, an, a Beatles fan, there's these stories back when the Beatles became so famous that 
they couldn't play live anymore because the speakers, the way that we could engineer speakers couldn't be louder than the crowds. So they hit a point where they couldn't play to huge crowds because the crowds were louder than the engineering of the speakers that we had to create the sound uh, for people to be able to hear. Um, There's a little bit of engineering challenge in there. Um, but thinking about these vibrations and sharing those vibrations out into, um, into the world. And another way that uh, we think about vibrations is like on this planet, um, you know, they, they create a lot of damage. Um, we can measure them by uh, putting things in the ground um, or putting things on the ground and seeing how they move around. Um, or even just, you know, in a, in a qualitative sense, seeing that this pool thrashing around, the water pouring around, um, and these cracks being created. Um, and we know that musical vibrations have to be created by something. I know there's, you know, thinking about the open Syed unit, if you're um, familiar with the sound unit is really focused on, well, how do we create vibrations? How do they alter the thing that they're, that you're vibrating? When you bang on something, what is happening to that physical item? Um, and so we know how we do that with music. You got to bang on the trash can, you got to strum, you got you to gotta do an action. Um, but what's going on with the earth? How is the earth creating all of these different, um, all these different vibrations? And like, where does it even get the power to do those things? Um, and so here's where we, I really like to think about those cross-cutting concepts and using them as a lens um, to really think about equitable sense making um, and, and we want to use the science and engineering practices, um, but these cross-cutting concepts are that tool that allows you to go further, allows you to dig deeper um, and truly leverage students' intellectual and cultural resources. So back to this earthquake in Mexico and this blue light. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit further in the article, the NPR article, um, it references a um, a scientist who said, I, I wonder if I can make these blue lights in my lab. And so thinking about the blue lights, realizing that it was a, a phenomenon that happened in the planet, on the planet, um, they thought, well, can I recreate that? Can I start that? Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing there and shift back over to the site and, um, and to a new resource. Um, and so there's our friend Kevin Bacon. Um, six degrees of phenomena. And um, on the site, um, I just added a new resource um, titled Six Degrees of Phenomena. And I, I really want to key in, um, you see down here, um, the site since the beginning has always been free. Um, I've always, uh, I, I maintain that it should be free. I pay out of pocket for the site, really want it to be a resource that everybody can use um, to to have these authentic experiences with students. Um, so you'll notice at the bottom, there's a PDF, there's a Jamboard, there's a Google slide, um, whatever works the easiest for you in your classroom. Um, they'll automatically, when you click on them, they'll have them uh, make a copy. So it'll make a copy that you can use in your Google Classroom. You can use however you would like. Um, but just to look at this for a second, this quote uh, by Einstein, the whole of science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking think a lot about that. Like we, when you think about the complexities of science, I disagree with that quote. But then when you think about a baby running their own experiments, you know, sitting in a high chair, taking something and just throwing it off the edge and then looking over the edge, going, huh, that goes down like every time. Um, and so the babies aren't thinking with these complex science ideas, but they're yet, they're, they're doing experiments or doing their own investigations. Um, and so I, I love this quote because I kind of go back and forth thinking about, is it more or is it just everyday thinking? And uh, yet when we are in schools, we commonly think that it needs to be something else. Um, we come at it from a different uh, viewpoint. Um, and so where I land is that, you know, everyday knowledge is more complex than I think we really give ourselves credit for, um, or that we give everybody credit for. Um, and so everyday knowledge is really flexible and multifaceted, yet the second you start asking somebody like, why, why is there blue light sometimes when there's an earthquake? People have tons of ideas. People immediately will start sharing, well, maybe it's because of this, and maybe it's this, and maybe it's that. Or they'll think of, well, 
where are there other times where I've seen blue light, like a spark? Like sometimes I've seen a spark happen and it was kind of blue and it was really dark. Or I ate those um, crazy chalky lifesavers at camp. And when you turn the lights off, you saw these blue sparks. Like, does that have to do with an earthquake? Um, and so we walking around every day, we have tons of like little mini theories. Um, and I, I really like to stay away from the idea of thinking of them as misconceptions um, because they're just ideas that have worked for us so far. Um, we haven't met a situation or a scenario um, where we've tried to think about these ideas in a different way. Um, and the uh, original research around misconceptions um, was the argument that these are part of something fundamentally productive and important in student thinking. Um, and so like we need these ideas. Um, I'm sure people have seen the NSTA article about misconceptions being these necessary stepping stones. Um, and so, but I, I love to go back and forth. Um, it's also super complex, you know, heating things up. I was thinking when you were saying it's a dry heat in Arizona, like, wait, is there a version of like dry, rapid molecular motion? Like how can we dry molecules and what makes it a dry? And so like, you know, just allowing your, your mind to wander um, and thinking about like heating things makes them melt, right? Like I bet a lot of people could think of something right now, heat it, you make it melt. But if you heat an egg, it makes it go more solid. Um, or you put gloves on to keep your hands warm, um, but then you put oven mitts on to keep your hands cool from touching stuff in the oven. Um, and you can think of a ton of these like clouds, are, are super, super heavy, um, but a lot of things just fall when there's nothing on under them holding them down. So like, who's holding up the clouds? What's up there holding up the clouds? Um, or thinking about removing material to uh, re remove weight from an object. Um, but if we work out, I've been doing some triathlons recently, um, definitely feeling like an amateur and, uh, and you lose weight. So you move around more and you lose weight. Um, so with this, kind of idea in mind, um, lots of people get to the site. And a question that I hear often is um, with a little bit of like, I don't know where to start. I'm not sure what to do. Is this the right one? Is this the one that I should be using? Like, is this going to be good for my students? Um, and I, I always think of the um, that Robert Frost um, poem, The Road Not Taken, um, and how kind of the, the main idea is like, the path that you do take is often the opposite of what you want to do. Um, and so um, it was a, the poem from what I've heard um, was that it was a joke that they would always take the wrong path. And then after they would think, oh, we should have gone the other way. Um, and isn't that life? And isn't that the way that we do authentic science? Like when we do one investigation, the first thing we're often thinking is like, great. All right, now we need to do this. Or now we need to think about that. Um, and so this resource, Six Degrees of Phenomena, is uh, a tool to, to put those ideas together and to put them down in a public place. Um, and so think of each row, each kind of column here, phenomenon one, two, all the way up to seven, as being one of the items. Maybe phenomenon one is the, the earthquake with the blue, um, the blue sky effect. And so that's what we're trying to figure out. Immediately, we would have some questions. Um, and then we think about what science ideas do I know? What are those disciplinary core ideas that I have that are associated? Um, you know, obviously students aren't thinking about DCIs, um, but they might be thinking of things that this makes them think of. Um, and then the section at the bottom is things that you would wanna do potentially. And maybe you wanna Google them. Maybe you like, I'd, I'd love to see data about this. I wanna see if this happens all the time. Does this happen in different places? Maybe there's people I want to talk to, I want to investigate, I want to interview some people from the area um, or do some experiments. Um, and so I wanted to share this as a resource. Um, and, and while it looks like a, a worksheet, something to fill out, um, I think of it as, uh, as very different than a worksheet. A worksheet, thinking of a paper task um, to give to students um, or a sheet of paper, I googled the definition. It's a sheet of paper on which one performs work. Um, and as we all know, the, the actual work in science is never done on a sheet of paper. The work's done in sense making and making those connections um, in our mind. And I can let's stop sharing here. Um, is making those connections and doing that thinking on your own 
Um, and I think of this as a tool. Uh, my wife um, is in forensics and works with uh, Dr. Worked with Dr. Henry Lee, and it was all about using a tool to help us figure things out, to map it out, to make the connections, to see it publicly. Um, and we know that science can't happen without going public with your thinking, going public with your ideas and arguing about it um, with others. Um, and, and we need those diverse ideas from everybody else from that classroom community. Um, and so I think of this as a, as a tool that is completely useless on itself. Um, but it's a tool to start making connections and start drawing those lines and pulling those things together, um, that can be a productive tool, a tool that, um, in essence, an epistemic tool, a tool that helps us work at knowing more um, and really extend the amount of work that we can do. So I will stop there. I saw one comment in the chat as we transition um, that the, um, the links are in there. Um, and so they'll be in all formats. Um, and you can definitely make copies and do whatever you need to do with those. And I'll hang out so that if there are any specific questions, I'll be here. That's great. Thank you so much, TJ. Um, we do have a couple questions that we've collected here. Um, Missy, do you want to go ahead and maybe just uh, one real good one right now? And we can come back to more of those towards the end also. Sure. So I'm going to put the students in the hot seat this, with this question. So do you have ideas on, for having students come up with phenomena in a classroom in an organic way? Yes, definitely. Um, and so the, the bottom row, the like this reminds me of or this makes me think of, um, that was a key in, um, in thinking about early versions of, of the NGSS storylines and kind of this transition into the open sciad is this idea of related phenomena. Um, you know, often we as the, as the educators, we as the teachers, we know it connects. And we are like, this one's so good. This is such a good phenomenon for teaching, blah. But then when you introduce it to students, they're like, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> I don't know what that, what causes that. I don't know how that's connected to something else. Um, and so um, really keeping that door open, the like, what else? Talk to your friends, talk to your parents, talk to your family. Um, and, and initially, I think when I started, I started thinking like, don't Google, resist the urge to Google. But the earth, the planet, the universe that we're trying to understand using science is so complex um, that you know we can Google content all day long, but we can't Google knowledge. Um, and that's really our ultimate aim. Um, and so often I ask students, go figure it out, find out what else, what else do we need to know? Um, because as many plausible ideas that we can throw in the, in the center of the classroom, kind of our, our pool of ideas to draw from, um, phenomena automatically starts flowing. And if you set up that, classroom culture of like, huh, that's a good, yeah, I'm not sure that I know what that is. Immediately, students start adding ideas and also saying, I know something that I don't know. <laughs> I, I have an, another thing that I don't understand. And they start sharing those ideas. Um, and you pretty, pretty quickly come up with your own kind of classroom curated phenomena cache um, that students feel like we're just fooling around. We're just figuring out the stuff that we want to do. So I'm going to jump in here just for a second. It sounds like you're really encouraging students to, um, in an iter iterative way, to modify that phenomena statement as they go on. And you're capturing the interest of students who, who initially thought, I don't really care about that idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and really um, problematizing like what science looks like. A lot of times, oftentimes, it's conversations. You know, you put a bunch of engineers in a room, a bunch of scientists in a room, they're always just talking to each other, talking over each other, trying, trying to figure out like, what do we know and how can we advance that, um, that forward? And uh, when students are engaged, you know it. Classroom gets loud, lots of vibrations. So TJ, just to piggyback on something that you said, the word culture and creating this class culture. So we have many classrooms that have not gone into this, this pathway, gone down this pathway of using phenomena to drive learning. And to those teachers that um, have not jumped into it and have and feel a little reticent, and, and what do you say about developing a class culture? What are some steps in creating that culture of, of discovery, that culture of inquisitiveness, of, of curiosity? 
that that drives that phenomena classroom driven classroom it's it, i mean it's definitely a challenge um because when we think about the the kind of the way that the classrooms are set up the way that schooling is set up they know that you know <laughs> you know students have been playing the school game for a very long time you're the one being paid you're in the front of the room you probably know the answers um, and so my recommendation and it's like i said very challenging um, is to uh, is to try to play around with that power dynamic a little bit and uh, and so i try to find something that i don't know and i launched the school year with that um, you know and there are tons of things that you know i um, right now I'm, I'm teaching a stem education theory course and if I did it right, if I introduced the first day correctly, at least one student will come up at the end and tell me something they don't know. And I had one student tell me about a hiker that a couple people died and they weren't sure why. And I was like, cool, stop right there. I wanna try to figure that out. <laughs> and so like having that mentality of like, don't tell me, like, let's see if we can, let me see if I can work it through. And I'd love to keep that, um, that going. Um, the second thing is this is a poker face, like spending a lot of time and communicating clearly with parents um, I know there are some phenomenal um, NGSS resources for parents, um, NGSS parent guides um, that have been translated into multiple languages. It's huge for parents to know that students hopefully are going to come home with way more questions than bows on a little clean kind of wrapped up lesson. Um, because the earth is complex. You know, there's so many things going on that when we figure out one thing, we have a thousand more questions. Um, and so encouraging the, the culture of the class to be one of like, let's figure out as many things as we don't know um, as possible. And then we'll work to, to really uncover those. Cause truly like we're, we're not trying to cover standards. We're trying to uncover the science, the science ideas. That's great. great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll come back to a couple more questions at the end. Right now, we'd like to, now that we're all warmed up here, we can turn things over to Vanessa and Jennifer. Vanessa, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And thanks, TJ. Uh, such infectious enthusiasm. Um, I'm excited to build on those great ideas. Um, I'm Vanessa Walbrink, Associate Director of Next Gen Science at WestEd. And we're gonna be building on those ideas by talking about more strategies to make earth and space science more accessible, relevant and meaningful for students. So fits right in there. Uh, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jennifer Self, the science review lead at Next Gen Science. And um, very quickly, if you don't know about our project, uh, Next Gen Science, um, we were formerly the science team at Achieve, which is the nonprofit that coordinated the development of the NGSS with the 26 lead states. And now we're a project housed at WestEd. And so there at WestEd, we are continuing our work to um, improve science teaching and learning through instructional materials reviews, meaningful uh, partnerships with districts, and uh, stewardship of the NGSS through developing free and publicly available resources to help with the, the field with understanding and implementing the standards. And so today we're gonna to be sharing some of those resources with you. But first, before we dig in, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please put in the chat one thing from your experience that gets kids really excited to learn about earth and space science and feel free to use any inspiration from TJ's session as well. <laughs> Put in my chat. Great, and as you're all thinking about that and adding some ideas, I'm gonna briefly just share um, the plan for this brief um, session, this half of the webinar. We're gonna be talking about five key features that can help Earth and Space Science learning be more accessible, relevant, meaningful um, through authenticity, why that matters for students and how you can find out more. And um, just a quick note, we presented a session through the ESS and GSS work group last November all about what matters most when looking at earth and space science instructional materials. So if you haven't seen that, we encourage you to check it out and we've included a link there. And actually, um, uh, for all of the resources we're talking about today, 
um, I, we made a little hub with all of the links, uh, this link in the corner there, and Jennifer just put it in the chat box. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so be sure to check that out as well. I've seen some great responses coming into the chat. Um, seeing a lot of examples, <laughs> natural disasters, things that kids are seeing and happening in the world around them, um, black holes, things that are a little mysterious that you might want to figure out, something about local geology, um, so things that might connect to um, places where uh, near where the kids are, um, superlatives, biggest, fastest, most dangerous. Um, very cool, that earthquake in Mexico, so things happening in the news. Um, really cool. So thank you for sharing those. And there's actually a lot of overlap with the, um, the things you're talking about and the five features we've identified here. Um, and quickly, the, these five features were developed through a literature review of the research a survey of educators, curriculum developers, district leaders, researchers, and feedback from an advisory board. And you can read all about the process and these features themselves in our resource authentic science experiences, um, which is linked in the document. Um, and I'm not gonna read these out loud now because we're going to be diving into them more deeply in a moment. But first, I just wanna share a little bit more about why these features are worth prioritizing. Um, so learning science in the more traditional way by maybe listening to lectures and then confirming what you learned in a lab or with a worksheet can often feel a bit contrived and can really, it can seem disconnected from how science is practiced as a profession and how science can just help you in your everyday life. Why is it relevant? Um, so these features that we're talking about today can help close that gap um, making science in a classroom more similar to how it's practiced as a profession and making it really clear how it can help you in your everyday life or explain the world around you. And that's hugely important to make it feel meaningful and to think of a scientist as something beyond, you know, the stereotype of an old white man in a lab coat. <laughs> um, and second, enacting these features can make kids more engaged. And, you know, I used to think like, yeah, engaged is a kind of a nice to have, but is it really necessary? Um, but actually, research shows that engaged students actually learn better and they do their best work and they're more likely to feel empowered, attracted to challenges, use effective strategies, make appropriate use of feedback. So this can really make a big difference for students, which is exciting. And so we thought instead of talking through the features abstractly, we would talk through an example. So this example is actually an excerpt from a 90 minute task from the Tennessee District Science Network Task Library, which is a set of tasks developed by uh, Tennessee educator work groups, our team supported and was released in January of this year. Um, and this link is in the hub, by the way. Um, and they're of course not perfect, but the authors did prioritize a lot of the features we're talking about today when developing them. So we just took an earth and space science example and, and thought we would use it to, to talk through these. So this high school student task has this scenario here. Every summer, Nicholas visits his great grandmother in Briceville. Although he loves his great grandmother, he dreads spending two weeks in a town that has so little to do. He's rummaging through a box in the attic with found costumes and an old fashioned advertisement for a play. His great grandmother told him there used to be an opera house in a bustling community in Briceville. And that sounds very different than what he sees today. So what factors could explain this change? And so this task has a three dimensional claim. This is the kind of the integrated DCI, SEP, and CCC learning targeted. Um, and not pictured here is the whole teacher guide, which has a lot of additional information and specific high school elements targeted as well. Um, 
And so students are applying an understanding of how the availability of natural resources affects communities and individuals by integrating and evaluating sources of information in order to communicate how factors associated with coal mining and Bryceville in the Bryceville community have affected individuals in the community over time. Um, so this is the kind of the ultimate goal of, of this task. And so with this brief idea, this brief overview of the task in mind, let's go over these five features and talk about them a little bit more. So this first one is probably going to look familiar to you. Um, students are integrating knowledge and practice in order to figure something out with clear learning goals. And so this approach might differ from previous strategies from, you know, when I was in school, rather than just focusing on disciplinary core idea knowledge or separately asking students to interpret some data. This more authentically reflects how knowledge and skills are used by scientists and leads to deeper learning for kids. So while we talk a lot about um, science instruction being student led, um, that doesn't mean that you have that you don't have really clear targeted learning goals for the learning as well. And second, uh, connecting science instruction to students' personal interests and identities and experiences. Um, that's not just increasing motivation and a feeling of belonging, but it's also linked to decisions later in life, educational decisions, career choices might lead to more kids in STEM. Um, and in this example in particular, the local context of the scenario can provide a lot of opportunity for the teacher to elicit student experiences. Uh, and I saw that in the comments as well, somebody mentioned, you know, local phenomena um, can make kids really, really excited and motivated to figure things out. Um, and also can, you know, connect to identities and connect to family members as well. And um, although it's a little less visible in this example, this is, it's not only connecting to student prior experiences, but also leveraging their prior science knowledge learning as well. Um, so it's helpful to look at how you can build and explicitly connect to what they've already learned across all three dimensions, in addition to their personal experiences. And um, another factor with this feature is, is kind of the culture and language side of things. So thinking about, you know, how can you leverage linguistic assets of learners, like encouraging them to use familiar language and modes of expression as they make sense of these new ideas? Um, you know, all these things can create a more inclusive environment in a science classroom that allows students to bring their whole selves to the table. And again, possibly challenging any preconceived notions about who gets to be a scientist. Is it that old man in a lab coat or, or could it be, you know, uh, your student? Um, and so I'm gonna actually pass it on to my colleague, Jennifer Self to talk through the last three features. Hi everyone. I hope you're taking good notes because you know, there'll be a test at the end. <laughs> I'm only halfway joking, but we do want to get your thoughts on these five at the end. So uh, it, is, it is important to think about these. Okay, so this third one, we don't have to spend a lot of time on. This is what TJ just talked about at the beginning of the webinar. This is about phenomena or problems. So students aren't just using the science for the sake of memorizing the science. Students are using the science to explain the world around them. And I'll just point out uh, again, in case you missed it, that these tasks were written by teachers in Tennessee. So this was something that they actually cared about. This was the world around them, this change in the community that they saw that their students actually saw. Um, so we know that uh, phenomena driven instruction is more effective when the phenomena are culturally or personally relevant to students, the problems matter to uh, their students, their families, their communities. Um, having phenomena driven instruction also gives all the students an access point to enter the conversation. So we're not just talking about uh, 
students who are more comfortable with academic language being able to engage with the science instruction. So now everyone can look at something and talk about something using their own language and be engaged. Uh, since we've talked about this a lot with TJ, we'll move on to the fourth one here. This is the students learn by engaging with both peers and adults. There's not a lot on this slide because this actually is not an area of strength in this task. There may be ways to strengthen it. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this. There's, there's a lot more information and in the resource about authentic science experiences. But the idea is that learning as a social enterprise, right? We know that discourse, talking about all these ideas, is really critical for helping students share ideas, uh, make sense of ideas. It also, of course, supports language development when students are all talking and thinking about the same kinds of things. Uh, when students are engaged with their peers and the teacher, that also gives them an opportunity to get feedback, which is going to help them grow in their learning. Uh, separately, kind of embedded in this idea is, is the um, area of research about the effects of deep interactions with STEM professionals. So we found that these interactions can increase students' interest in STEM careers, help them build positive student science identities, build supportive environments. And so this task doesn't really do these things. It doesn't give students opportunities to build uh, relationships with STEM professionals or to get feedback from the teacher or to have discourse with the peers. Um, so that's something that we would wanna think about when we want to implement something like this in classrooms. The fifth idea is that it's this whole idea of assessments. So kind of building on the feedback from the last one. So students engage in a variety of assess assessment processes that showcase ongoing learning. So it's all about supporting learning, which means that it's more focused on formative assessments rather than summative. So these are, of course, the assessments embedded throughout the learning process uh, that enable students to improve their performance. And this is a, a big, deep and weighty meaty area of the paper. So I'll just kind of summarize it, but there are some important points here that we want to see. And if, you know, to have learning experiences be really authentic with regard to assessment. So we want them to support a growth mindset, uh, encouraging mistakes and improvement over time. So it's okay to make mistakes, it's expected. Uh, also, these kinds of assessments can build soft skills uh, when students engage in self-assessment and reflection. They can uh, build these kinds of skills that we, we know they need. The, these kinds of assessments also value knowledge rather than compliance, such as whether students have completed their homework on time. And so valuing the knowledge will tell us more about the actual student proficiency, which is going to help students learn. Uh, and of course, kind of going back to the first feature that Vanessa talked about, they assess knowledge and practice in an integrated manner, uh, instead of, say, asking whether they have memorized the definitions or the procedures. So overall, um, what we value gets assessed in the classroom, and what we assess gets valued by the students. This particular, for this fifth principle, uh, this task applies some of these. It has a rubric that supports teachers to give feedback to students that helps them grow and improve rather than just giving them a score at the end. Um, it does value knowledge and it integrates uh, some of the, the disciplinary ideas with practices. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, we are gonna give you a chance, like I said, not exactly a task, but we wanna get your ideas. If you were to implement this task or something similar, how would you strengthen one area? 
we want to apply this growth mindset to think about how to improve just one little bit in one way uh, for one of these five features. So how would we add some way for, say, students to engage more with their peers or with adults, with STEM professionals? How would we add more ways for students to reflect on their own learning? How would we increase the uh, engagement of students um, using their interests, culture, identities? So Vanessa is now showing you the Padlet. The idea here is to uh, pick one of these areas, click on a little plus sign under that area, and then add your idea for strengthening the task or how you would improve it in your classroom. So we'll take about four minutes here to add your thinking. Seen some great ideas so far. Guest speakers talking about the chemistry of burning coal, using local examples for wherever you are, wherever your students are. Uh, more hands on modeling and experimenting. Having students present to peers. This is great. And I know this isn't Google Plus, but you can add a plus one to those ideas from your colleagues that you agree with. Jennifer, real quick question, logistical question. Um, someone is trying to get the interactivity to work, uh, clicking on the plus and nothing's happening. Any suggestions there? Yeah, I don't know what the limits are for participants. I, I think we're under it, but you might just try to refresh the page, refresh the Padlet, and see if you can then interact. All right, I'll give you just about 30 more seconds to read through your colleagues ideas, add your plus ones. Thanks for all the ed tech tips, Wendy. All right, so the idea here is that no matter what we're working on, no matter what kind of resource we're using in the classroom, we can always improve. All of us can improve all the time. 
And so these are five ways, five areas where we can, if we make small improvements, we can help move the learning experiences for students towards something that's more authentic and engaging and therefore meaningful and effective for students. Um, so we don't need to do everything right away, right? We want to start small. We don't need to apply all the principles at once if this is the first time that you've seen them. Um, that's never a good idea. And uh, <laughs> so maybe start with just one lesson to apply the principles or apply just one. If you go to the, the hub, the link I shared earlier, you'll find the resources that can help with this work, try to figure out how to make these small incremental improvements. And we just apply this growth mindset that we want for students to all of our work. And we can also learn from each other, you know, network here through um, the Twitter networks, in GSS chat, through your state or district networks. Um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we can always grow and learn from each other. And along the way, uh, Vanessa and I and our colleagues are happy to help. Feel free to contact us at any time. And we're excited to go along this journey with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, Missy, I think we have time for one, maybe one or maybe two questions. Sure, absolutely. Thanks. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. And, and I thought it was a, a wonderful connection with uh, what TJ shared. So um, I think everything is somewhat op operational, but I think you know we might need a little bit more help. So the questions, uh, where can teachers start in locating local phenomena to drive student learning that incorporates the students' funds of knowledge or their assets to ensure that er learning is equitable, especially if those teachers don't live in that area where they teach? Well, so we're answering from the standpoint of um, trying to help students have effective learning experiences, right? So we would want to choose phenomena that are meaningful, but also would be supportive of student learning in particular ways. So um, I share this example with some people. If, if kids think bubbles are super cool, um, that's great, unless they're kindergarten students, in which case trying to explain what bubbles are and how they're made might not be the most effective way for them to learn anything related to kindergarten and first grade or second grade learning goals. Um, <laughs> so it, it is helpful if the teacher facilitates, presents things to students that are going to be um, exciting for them but also in the realm of something that is somewhat great appropriate. Um, there are lots of places to find these ideas, like um, the NGSS Phenomena site. Um, ideally, some resources, some curriculum resources available. They're moving in the direction of providing these kinds of example phenomena. And then, um, as we discussed earlier, students can build off of those to find things that are related in, in the local area. A lot of great curriculum pr provide examples of ways to spin off and make something more localized. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see, we have time for one more. Um, okay. Well, you look, I could add one quick thing. Um, just the thinking about local phenomena, um, I always, always, always um, find this a perfect time to reach out to um, kind of the, the families, communities, the local experts um, to bring in to do a, a walk around the, um, you know, along the, the school community. There's a lot of resources at the learning in places um, that are really, really helpful when thinking about community based um, phenomena um, and just leveraging the, the and almost kind of problematizing the science that um, maybe, you know, your uncle's not a scientist, but grass looks really, really good in, in that yard <laughs> near the school or, you know, has the oldest, somebody has the oldest tree in, on the property or really, really cool rocks. You know, I've worked at a district where right near them is a mall and they did some blasting to build a parking lot. That parking lot is so exciting for earth science and going and looking at all the rocks and all the structures. I keep looking at your background, like 
sorry, but it looks like that parking lot and you go there and you park and you can look around, you can do a Google, um, you know, we can go there virtually and just drop the little yellow Google guy in and look at the rocks. And so um, there's a lot that you can do to, to connect locally and, um, and really build off of family and local communities expertise. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we're at a point where we're going to be wrapping up. However, I'd like the if presenters, if you don't mind, stay on for just a couple more minutes afterwards, because we've got some great questions that are still uh, in the hopper, um, including a terrific one by Randy, and we'd love to hit up. Aida? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we will stay behind. So if you'd like to stay behind, we're just going to take a couple seconds here to uh, do a couple wrap up things. First of all, if one of my colleagues could drop that link in for our needs assessment into the chat box. Our next webinar is October 14th and it will be a presentation from ESRI on new things from ESRI for K-12 related to NGSS ESS. You'll want to be sure to join us for that. Uh, also make sure that you um, do contribute to our needs assessment, take you just four or five minutes and we really appreciate that. Um, so the post webinar survey, if uh, Mitchell or Bradley, if you could drop that link in, we also would love to have you fill out the post webinar survey, especially if you'd like to have a certificate of participation for this webinar. The only way to get that is to fill out that survey. So please do take care of that as well. And then um, I will just very quickly say a couple of things about the National Association of Geoscience Teachers. Of course, we welcome you to join us as a member, uh, but we do also have a webinar series. There is about one webinar per week in that webinar series. And we're very proud to be one of the webinars in that series. So please do take a look on the NAGT website for the webinar series and lots of other information available on projects that you can see listed there at the bottom. I'm gonna turn it over to Missy here to talk about Nesta, Missy. Very briefly, um, hi everybody. I'm gonna suggest that you join the premier K-12 or science education uh, organization in the, in the country. Um, and we host webinars. We do, we're a prominent fixture at NSTA conferences. Uh, we have local people that are on the floor helping out in their regions. Um, and I'd like you to be one of us. So please join us. Thanks, Missy. And Ed, something about AGI, please. Sure, hi. I'm Ed Robeck. I direct education and outreach for AGI, which includes their Science Week, which is celebrated each October. Um, we'd love to have you visit our website and see the many different resources and opportunities that we provide for K-12 teachers, including professional development, curriculum materials, and something called Education Geosource, which is a searchable database of third-party materials, which is quite rich and available for use for by anyone and um, organizations. So, Thanks very much for being here. Really appreciate your participation in this webinar as with all. Thank you, Ed. And um, I'll leave our contact information up just for a second, but uh, really we do encourage you to hang around here. I'm gonna open it back up to, to questions. Um, Missy, I think you had one. I'm gonna stop yeah. sharing. There we go. I think you had one that um, perhaps was put into the chat box. Yeah, this one was from Randy Russell. And Randy has an authentic phenomenon are often closely connected to the personal experiences of students. I develop computer-based educational simulations. Often those simulations intentionally present topics that are beyond normal experience in terms of size, time scale, safety, cost, such as run, running a virtual nuclear reactor or evolve a population over set hundreds of generations or construct a star or a galaxy. About how to reconcile these seemingly conflicting needs of personal connection versus phenomenon that are outside normal experiences, but are still in the NGSS. Well, uh, from my take on it, the younger the students are, the more they need a concrete personal connection. But by the time students are in high school, certainly, we need them to be interested and curious about the world that's a little beyond their neighborhood, right? So they, they have to have a global perspective by that time. They have to be able to care about solving problems on a global scale. Um, so it's a, it depends on how old the students are as to how exact, how concrete, how immediate these phenomena really need to be, but this is something that we can facilitate um, student interest in, 
you know, it, they have to see it, understand it, care about it, but it doesn't have to be in their backyard. I would say the first thing it made me think of was the cross-cutting concepts. I mean, that it's, it's th scale, you know, thinking about scale. And if you've never seen Stommel diagrams, Stommel diagrams are so awesome. It's actually a, a graph of time versus space, like temporal versus spatial. And, um, and so I've even used that um, in a, a, a new topic that we're working on around um, a new PD pathway that's focused around climate science um, and using big data to think about the oceans and how the oceans can help us explain a lot of complex system level phenomena um, on the planet. Um, and one of the hardest things with the ocean is, is scale, time and, and, and size and being able to shrink things down to like algae in a, in a pool or algae on a, on a lab desk all the way up to like, you know, harmful algal blooms and phytoplankton and what's happening with global currents happening more or less based on things now. And like, how could it, how could we have flooding and droughts happening on, in different places on the same planet at the same time? Um, and so the more that we can think of these complex ideas um, as meaningful phenomena that we want to figure out, um, the more kind of exciting I think the science gets and, and relevant um, to the kind of work that scientists really are doing right now. Okay, well, uh, thank you everybody. One more. Um, so NGSS in, in emphasizes instruction using world, real world phenomenon. How fictional can a scenario be before it's no longer real world? Is it okay to use fictional phenomenon? Well, <laughs> um, the idea of okay is a little, little funny to me because there's no, no police. But uh, if we're talking about being engaging for students, um, so there, it's, um, it's kind of a, a gray area, almost. it's not black or white. Um, things are going to be more, feel more authentic, more mod motivating for students to want to learn the more they think they're real, right? Because students are so enmeshed in this world of video games that figuring out the video game world phenomena is not terribly engaging and motivating. Uh, so, you know, we've seen things that are realistic, although not exactly real, you know, so if um, there's a real story, but they change the names to protect the innocent, a uh, student can find that very motivating and engaging. Um, but the more realistic and related to their lives that you can make it as, as teachers, um, the more students will engage. Hey, that's terrific. And I think if we can just squeeze in one more, um, thank you, Mitch and, Brent and uh, Bradley. Uh, let's see, you said that there, wait a minute. Oh, um, you said that there were five features were a product of a literature review. Has that review been published and is it accessible in any way? Uh, no, we did not publish that, but the authentic uh, science experiences document does um, include citations for research behind a lot of the ideas. So you can see um, some of the, the citations there, if that's helpful. Terrific, thank you. Aida, I think that wraps it up. I think so. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to our presenters, TJ, Jennifer, and Vanessa. It was a wonderful webinar. Great way to kick off the, the new school year. Welcome back, everybody. We'll see you again on October 14th for our next webinar. Please watch your inbox for registration information coming soon. Have a great afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you.